Very good. We're now live, which is great. So um, welcome to everyone for this session. Um, we're looking here at urbanisation, a number of issues. My name is Tim Nicholl, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor at Liverpool John Moores University in the UK. And I'm moderating the meeting. We're joined really by some very excellent uh, panellists. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in due course. But before we begin the discussion, what I'd like to do is to frame perhaps the context of it. And very much the session is posited on the idea that after many years of rapid population growth, the world's population is actually expected to stop growing by the end of the century. But within this, um, this larger projection at a world level, there's a much more nuanced story. And I think this is what we're going to explore today. The current projections suggest that while Europe and Latin America, for example, are going to experience declining populations, um, we know that Africa will be the region in the future that's going to experience population growth. One of the significant variables around these projections is the issue around migration, which is very topical at the moment. Now, in the context of growth, the UN projections have noted that six countries are going to account for more than half of the world's population growth through to the end of the century. Five of those are going to be in Africa. We're looking at Nigeria, Tanzania, we're thinking about Ethiopia, Angola, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the other country being Pakistan. And in experiencing these changes of population and growth, the question arises what changes are there also in the composition of this world population? And I note here that the general trend is projected to be around an aging population. And again, UN stats show that the world medium age in the 1950s was 24, it's currently at 31, but it's projected to rise to 42 by 2100, by the end of the century. And uh, this is a medium figure, and countries and regions are going to experience different profiles. But we are aware that ageing populations have significant economic and social implications. We need also note the trend towards urbanisation. I think this will come out very strongly in our discussion, I'm sure. And the narrative here is of increasing urbanisation, driven very much by industrialization, and leading to the growth of what we term the mega city. Uh, in the 1950s, these figures are... I, I'm quite startling. Um, the urban population of the world was estimated to be 751 million, and this had grown to 4.2 billion by 2018. And by 2050, it's projected that 75% of the world's population are going to be living in urban environments. So in the past 70 years, we've seen a huge period of significant change. Um, in Asia, population growth has gone from 17.5% in the 1950s to 51% currently. In Latin America and the Caribbean, it's moved in the same period from 41% to 81%. These are significant changes over a relatively short period of time. And along with this change has come the increase of this idea of the megacity. Cities of more than 8 or 10 million people, the majority of, uh, of whom are now going to be found developing in Asia. So we have increasing urbanisation. Uh, we've got larger city op sort of populations. With that, we have a range of issues. And I think, again, will come up in the conversation social and economic, issues around water, sanitation, rubbish disposal, pollution, poverty, crime, societal harmony, a whole range of issues that require thoughtful and considered attention. And I believe these are the issues you will be touching upon. So with that basic introduction, could I just invite Avi perhaps to begin, introduce himself and begin the discussion? Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, I'm very glad to participate in this uh, special session. Uh, I am uh, from Israel, live in the city of uh, Rehovot, which is well known by the Weizmann Institute. Uh, two presidents came from this city, and maybe I'm the third one. Uh, I, I, I work 36 years at the Union of Local Authorities in Israel, which is in the United States called the, the League of Cities of Conference of Mayors. And I was the uh, deputy director general responsible for the international relation, tourism, and other uh, elements. Uh, in, within this uh, framework of activities, which you well known as maybe sister cities and others, uh, I decided in '94 to check the situation in Israel as an answer to what happened in the Gulf War where the first time in Israel, cities were attacked. Until this war, all the wars that Israel faced was on the border or on the other side. But this was the first time that missiles came into the cities 
and we didn't know how to act. And what are the role of the local authorities in this uh, regard? So I call to all my friends from the sister cities to come to a conference on local authorities confronting disaster and emergency. And to my surprise, about 1,000 people, including ministers and others, came to Israel from 40 countries to, do- to join to this uh, event. And after this event, many people came to me and say, "Why not to continue this uh, this element?" And this uh, international organization is, exists until now. And uh, what what is the reason is until now, until that occasion, everything was the responsibility of the government. But what's happened when it's go down? Who is the first to tackle with the problem and who is the last to remain with the problem? This is the local authorities. This is the mayors. And they have to give answer to the citizen to find solutions. And within the, the years, and especially after this big pandemic, in Israel, the power and the authorities and the responsibilities moved from the government to the local authorities. And therefore, and therefore, it was, uh, it came to the cities to give answers. For example, if there something, a pandemic came in a city, in a building, who will take care in In, in big uh, houses about the old people, people who maybe don't feel good, people who need help. How we as a neighbors, how we as a cities, how we answer to these needs. It is not anymore the question how the government is dealing with the subject. It is not anymore the question how much money is invested. It is more people to people. And therefore, I think, and therefore I joined to this session in order to give the topic of human factor in resilient cities. Because when you build mega cities, you don't need to forget the individual citizen. And you need to give answers to these individuals that in time of crisis will not be able to receive any assistance from the government and in some cases also not from the cities. They will need this from the neighbors. The question, are we are training ourselves to this situation? Are we aware uh, to this situation? How we educate the children to know what's happened in such case? How we are dealing with with the old age people in order to deal in this uh, situation. Therefore, I think what we need is training, and this is the responsibility of the cities to give training, and not only give training, to put it as a must. The same that we in Israel, we need in every uh, building to make every half a year a check Of our emergency elements, this should be one topic that has to be not only by uh, everybody who want to do it voluntarily. it has to be done by order, because in this way we will be better prepared to such situation. And I would like also to come to another topic, and this is. The instruments that we can use in, in, in case of emergency. We are all using uh, mobiles and uh, telephones and other equipment. What's happened in time of crisis when things are not working? We have uh, invented the uh, missiles to the moon, but we didn't pay attention to small elements that can, can save life. It, we, when we are dealing in, in crisis or problems, when we don't have Wi-Fi or such things, we need to find or give to the academy and to the high-tech 
to give them the possibility and, and the, the resources in order to establish very easy elements that can be used by every single citizen in order to be able to, to answer this, uh, this crisis. And I think if we want a resilient city, we need to give answer to this uh, element. Another problem that I would like to raise is the, uh, the problem of multicultural citizen. What's happened when we have a crisis and people don't know the language? How we prepare to give them answer not knowing their language? How we give them answer not knowing their religion? Such thing has to be taken in consideration when we want to be prepared and when to, we want to be a better city looking for the future. And in this, I would like to make maybe a short a break to see after that to give possibility to answer to, to you and to the participant. Thank you very much. I mean, thank you very much. I think you, you talk in a particular context, but I think the issues that you've raised are issues that have come up in previous discussions pre-panel. So perhaps can I get a Tony first? Would you like to, to, to um, introduce yourself and, um, and take the, uh, the microphone? Okay, Tim. Thank you so much. Thank you for your introduction, Avi. Uh, it is an honor to be here on Horasis again. Uh, I really uh, resonate very much with the timeliness and the relevancy of the content that's being discussed in such an important time of major, major shifts and transitions on so many different aspects of our human life. Uh, my name is Tony Cho. I'm the CEO and founder of a platform called The Future of Cities, which is part think tank, part real estate uh, investment and development vehicle that's focused on ESG outcomes and impact using demonstration projects as a way to show a future for a regenerative city and venture capital ecosystem that's prototyping the technologies and the companies of the future that are going to impact the built environment. The built environment, as many of you know, accounts for over 50% of CO2 emissions and is one of the largest contributors uh, to, to climate change in the world. And we know that the cities, the built environment, will be reconstructed at least two times, maybe three times over in the next 30 years. So we have a major confluence of crises that are confronting us that can be only addressed with cross-sector collaboration at scale, public-private partnership, and people not working in silos anymore. So that's what we're looking to do is to open source a new sustainable development platform called Regenerative Placemaking, where we can take the human consideration into concern while we leverage technology and all the tools that we have, but appropriate technology for the benefit of humans, not for robots. And I think that that's really important when we talk about smart cities. My focus is, goes beyond smart cities. Yes, we absolutely need smart cities, but we need wise cities. And we need to leverage kind of ancient technologies and new technologies and create these and co-create these cities of the future in a more equitable, participatory, inclusive way. And we're really focused on solving problems for the 99%, not for the 1%. The 1% are going to be fine. And if we can build models of sustainable, attainable housing that are well homes for people around the world, we can solve a lot of problems. And I, like I, Avi was talking about before, there are certain fundamental rights that every citizen should have access to. You know, every citizen should have access to clean water, healthy air, roof over their head, internet, education, and all the resources exist today. Like Buckminster Fuller today said, Albert Einstein said, all of the technologies exist today to solve all the human problems that we have. We're just not directing our resources in the right places to solve these problems. And I think as Tim discussed earlier, you know, there's these very distinct trends happening. You know, this move from nation states to city states, you know, population stabilizing in the U.S. and, and in Europe, but then exploding in Africa and other places around the world. And so we and then simultaneously this this refugee crisis, which we're seeing in this con this horrible conflict, you know, with Russia invading Ukraine and other conflicts happening around the world that are less spoken of. It's, it's really time to galvanize together around democracy, around freedom and are really about co-creating regenerative cities of the future. And so my hope and my passion through our platform is that we can impact the lives of a billion people 
through these types of demonstration projects, best practices. And I'm based in Miami, where I'm the founder of a very large project called Magic City Innovation District. We're about to launch another demonstration project in another city in Florida. And <clears throat> we're consulting on various projects around the world. So I'm excited to be part of this, this great panel. And I look forward to the discussion. And thank you for having me. That's great. Thank you very much. And um, it's a great introduction. Antonio, could I come to you next, please? Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, it's uh, such an honor to be here discussing with all of you guys. So, um, yeah, I agree with all of you, so with uh, the two panelists um, um, that have been, uh, um, you know, making an introduction. So, uh, um, as mentioned in the very beginning, um, I'm a serial entrepreneur, so I was part of the founding team of My Taxi, the, the competitor in Europe of Uber, and we launched the platform in 2009. So, a long time ago, you know, the place to see, you know, more than a decade ago. And, um, and, and we had some um, uh, sustainable uh, objectives at that moment. So especially we tried to um, develop this uh, ride hailing company to cut down on, on uh, especially on um, pollution and noise uh, in cities, you know, to, to be able to um, to mathematize, you know, the, the, you know, the, the management of fleets you know, and, and then get a better appraisal of resources. But after a decade, um, trying to also to evangelize, telling telling people, okay, you should you should use the platform in, instead of raising your hand because then the, the taxi driver and the driver is wasting resources, uh, petrol, gas, etc. We see that uh, I'm not pretty sure that uh, we've been able to really evangelize, um, you know, the majority of the population because many people is still using uh, you know, their own cars. And the pollution is still there. More than 10 million people is dying exclusively by pollution every year. Uh, many people is also dying uh, because of the noise, you know, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really high in cities and then it's provoking heart attacks and many other things. So, and I don't know, good chance, good, good, uh, good for us. But then um, uh, actually I'm thinking that maybe we got wrong at some point because uh, in my case, I, I also prefer to talk about 21st century cities. And I think it's the, the right moment uh, in, in which cities must embrace open source and, um, and decentralized software tools to basically to remove and municipal or local dependence on monopolies, which are really damaging, you know, the uh, you know the the quality of life of, of many people, of citizens, force innovation and inclusion, ensure resilience and security of critical data and infrastructure, and and, uh, and in the end allow more inclusive access uh, to economic opportunities, including for uh, pensioners through fractional tokenized ownership models. So the first one is really, uh, it's, it's my obsession also with bureaucracy. Remove municipal dependence on monopolies and, uh, and oligopolies. It's something that my new company, Booniverse, which is a fintech tax tech company, is facing every day with regulation. So in the end, local governments have, in my opinion, a responsibility to enable high quality of life for residents and visitors to the city. Also, profit-seeking uh, conglomerates uh, have a primary responsibility to their shareholders. This often puts uh, conglomerates at odds with local municipalities and residents when the interests of, of uh, especially uh, investors by all means and shareholders are completely misaligned with the those of local residents and has been demonstrated with platform-based models like Uber, also my taxi, free now, uh, I, I, I found it, and, and Airbnb and many others who have quickly formed nearly global monopolies from, from uh, different places, right? So, and I think it's time to move forward because there are uh, legitimate alternatives to such models, such as a, via the emergence of, of platform cooperatives, uh, whereby the providers and users of, of a service actually co-own and share 
in the governance of the platform itself via uh, tokens or, or, or other type of, uh, of property. Great examples of this are, um, um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Resonate, you know, and the efforts to compete with uh, Airbnb. Uh, and also, um, you know, the, the DLT, you know, distributed layer technologies like blockchains, we should go even further to provide alternatives to, to, to this kind of monopolies in urban uh, environments. And there are examples like uh, the B token, which is building uh, a decentralized home sharing network. So, uh, so in the end, I think this is, this is uh, still the challenge we have, especially with this amount of population uh, um, you know, increasing. That's great. Thank you very much for that introduction. Lots of things I think we're going to pick up on in the discussion. So uh, finally, Maxim, could I come to your good self? Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, my name is Maxim Kisilov. And, you know, like I have been a member of the Harassis community uh, since 2012. So 10 years now, and I never fell through this time such awkward uh, awkwardly like like i'm feeling now because i'm in moscow as you can realize and you know i'm taking part of so to say responsibilities or um, none in my circle uh, no one from my students in skolkov institute of science and technology where i'm a professor none of the people in my ngo that i lead the human capital development foundation is supporting the official narrative. I don't know the people who would support that. But the point is that unfortunately we are helpless. Well, there's, there is no much we can do in order to stop this uh, war and, and having this, this, this government that, to me, my background is in clinical psychology. So for me, this is all insane what they do. But you know, this, this very awkward feeling of this inability to change anything. And I certainly understand uh, and the, the world's reaction to that, because this is an aggressive war, and this is something which would be a shame, unfortunately, for Russia for many, many, many years ahead. And especially hard for me, because my family is totally international. My older son is in Tel Aviv, in Israel. My two sons are in the United States, in New York, and in Providence, Rhode Island. And you can imagine how do I feel about everything. But okay, uh, I'm heading uh, the uh, City of Moscow, big organization, which is dedicated to the development of the human capital, covering you know these issues. Well, I I believe that occur to many of the world mega policies like Moscow, with the changing job markets, with the loss of jobs are due to automatization and digitalization of everything. Uh, we deal uh, with the issue of, you know, like, like the future, the future of the cities in terms of city economy and professions and those people who would be needed and so forth. And another very dramatic uh, issue that we're dealing right now, uh, if you know, a few years ago, there was the uh, pension reform in Russia and the the age of retirement was lifted and so what happened that uh, you know like right now a lot of people uh, who before that or after that it doesn't matter they in fact found themselves without the jobs that they used to have either through retirement or before that, you know, changing some of the life tracks, whatever, they need to be uh, or to stay economically active and involved. And so we provide these opportunities somehow for the for people uh, in this age where still they are still capable of doing a lot, but institutionally uh, they are not in need for the organizations they used to work for. So we provide the lifelong learning and we provide these competences that they might need in order to stay at the level of income and to stay within, you know, like economic activity. So this is 
the brief scope, of course. Uh, but uh, back to the things that you pointed out, I, I totally agree with, with all of you, with, with all of the issues mentioned. I'm just adding a little bit uh, other focus while I'm dealing with, which is about the total reconstruction of the job markets. And in the very near future, well, wherever the artificial intelligence would be able to replace people, it would do that. Well, right now, you know, of course, I'm not talking about the current situation. Current situation in, in Russia, including Moscow, might be very, very, very bad due to the sanctions and everything, which is quite understandable. But I'm talking a little bit about, so to say, like perspective, the, how we projected it just a just couple weeks ago, that we are looking forward this thing in all big cities of the world, where inevitably, well, the jobs will be lost in more and more numbers, and the people would need to do something and to stay uh, capable of, you know, like, I would say, like, like making some income. And, and this is one of the big issues that I see in urbanization and I see, you know, like, like in the future trends. We, we ran the study very recently showing that lots and lots of professions, they will not be in need whatsoever very soon it would happen much sooner than we wanted that within 10 years time globally hundreds of millions of jobs will be lost and first of all that will be about cities well thank you that's, that's thank you very for the Next, introduction. thank you i know on behalf of fellow panelists we welcome you as a member of the harassers community very warmly so Thank you for that. And some really fascinating themes came out of there. I, I just want to pick up on two, if I could, and then I'll allow you to, to introduce those different ones, if you wish. But I'm, I'm fascinated by this, this idea of the, the shift in power, if you like. So there's a discussion about the nation state, the city state, but then a more local form of, of empowerment that has come out in a number of your presentations. I wonder if you could just discuss that in a little more detail. In the second, I'd just like to pick on Maxim's point. And it's that paradox between the projections of greater urbanization because of industrialization, but the prospect of a post-industrial society developing as we go through Industry 4.0, Industry 5.0 now, where uh, we're aware, certainly I come from a business school background, aware of the impact of automation, digitization, and the reversal, perhaps, of all those global trends which are leading to it. I would like to discuss those too, if I could, and I think there may be some others. But can I just pick up on, on the points you were making about this empowerment of local communities? That seemed to be the thrust. Would, Tony, I don't know, do you, do you want to pick this up first? Because you've, you've, you've talked a couple of times about reimagining the city in relation to the state. But I, and then Avi and Antonio have talked about it at a, a further level. But I think your work probably takes us down to that community level. So you're on mute, Tony. So. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, I, I think this is a fascinating discussion of bringing the power, localizing power, decentralizing power and access back to the, the, the citizens and back to the city, the cities that we talk about. So the cities are emerging as as the new sovereign entities whereby they can make their own decisions, you know, in a decentralized way. And if you're, you know, leveraging technologies like blockchain and digital currencies and, you know, smart contracts to be able to do that is really creating a pathway. We're even seeing it now in the conflict, you know, and, and, and the invasion, you know, with, with Ukraine as a shifting global monetary fintech evolution that's happening right before our eyes. And I think that um, we should be mindful that the traditional banking system is, is basically dissolving before our eyes and that power is being reclaimed and decentralized at the local level. And this is a positive thing if we embrace it, we have the right regulations, we can be involved in it, we can steward it. And so, you know, the problem with centralized leadership at a federal level is they're just too, they're too disconnected from the actual issues at the local level. You know, zoning issues and, <clears throat> you know, needs and <clears throat> equity and inclusion. 
These are all local issues, cultural issues. They cannot be mandated by the federal government. They can't be ma- mandated by a central uh, system at all because it's just too disconnected and tone deaf from what's really happening at the ground level. And so we're seeing because of technology and because of these new tools and these smart contracts and these dis- decentralized peer-to-peer cooperative relationships that are happening, we're getting real information in real time and we can use AI and other technologies to help us make the best, smartest decisions that in all aspects of our lives. And you, and you talked about, you know, we talked about this, this, uh, this industrialization, you know, post-industrial 5.0 or work 5.0 and where we're going and automation and what's happening. <clears throat> that can be a good thing as long as we're prepared for it. You know, Avi was talking about training and education and the current education model is broken. And it's not preparing our youth for the cities and and the humanity of the future. And we need to be preparing people for what's happening and what's coming and and automation and everything that's happening in this post-work world. So I think that, you know, it's very important for it. Again, like I said before, cross-sector collaboration at scale where cities are working with NGOs, are working with the private sector together to collaborate on these solutions and, you know, prototyping solutions in Web3 and the metaverse and using these new technologies. So before we actually build these communities, why don't we prototype them in virtual reality before we bring it to the physical reality? Everything from construction materials to new models of ownership, you know, tokenization of real estate, you know, those types of things which will democratize access to an asset class that has been largely inaccessible for the majority of the world's population. Let's use these new emerging markets to prototype these new, and use these new tools to create sustainable net zero housing, to prototype new materials like hempcrete, to 3D print buildings in a more sustainable way, way with zero waste. You know, the construction industry, I'll repeat, is responsible for 50% of CO2 emissions in the world. So we can electrify all the automobiles and all the planes in the world, but none of it is going to impact as much as what's going to happen over the next 30 years with all these cities. You know, these mega cities are emerging in the Middle East and in the desert. You know, Africa is exploding, all these places. Well, why don't we create a new reality, create a new narrative around the way that we can co-create these cities of the future? And I think that now is really the moment. We don't have another moment. So this is the make or break it moment. And not only do we have aging population, but we also have, because of advancements in in medicine and longevity, we're having people living longer, you know, and specifically in in, um, developed nations, you know, they forecast that by 2100, the average age could exceed 100 years of age. So there's there's all this new um, demographic shifts, you know, between, you know, potentially a billion climate change refugees and populations aging and life extension that are going to have a demand on resources around the world. And unless we collaborate and get away from this, you know, uh, insular uh, protectionist, you know, concept, um, we're not going to be able to solve these problems for all of humanity. And I think that's really what we need to work on as, as a collective. Okay, thank you. I wanted to do you want to, to give some reflections? I think you, you posed a number of questions that we're following up on them. Um, yes, uh, first of all, uh, it was very interesting to, to listen to you, to see that I'm not alone in this topic of uh, local authorities. I remember 30 years ago when I came to, to the government, they say, you should go and clean the, the street before you come talking to me. And I'm very glad that uh, all five of us are sharing the same, uh, the same idea and the same change worldwide of uh, what's happening in the world when uh, there is a transmission of uh, power from government to local authorities and which I think we are coming to the, the real model of, uh, of uh, democracy. And I can give you an, an example uh, for example, in our neighborhood, they decided the, 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 the playground to change the playground. So the municipality make a Zoom call with all uh, the neighbors and we made our decision. Should we have more place for parking places where we put uh, the place for dogs uh, to play, etc., etc.? How much this interfered to the 
neighbor of this garden and so on. So such, such uh, element that is taking place, it shows that, that the democracy and the, the decision making is going now uh, uh, down to the, to the, the citizen. The question, how, how we make a criteria for, uh, for, for mega cities, how we make a, to make it systematically to work with. In one hand, the, the old people are uh, getting older and can exist. And on the other hand, at hand, the people are not making too many children. And uh, this is also a big problem. This is, for example, the big problem of Europe. It's not a problem in Israel because we need uh, many young people in order to, to live for, for the future. But uh, when I see what's happened in Europe, uh, Europe is uh, changing and its culture is changing. It has to be multicultural. The country, how they deal with this topic and so on. The same that we have to face a problem with four sectors uh, in Israel. We have 20% Arabs. We have uh, 20% extreme religious uh, not uh, taking part in, in the national uh, game and so on. So this kind of element has to be taken in consideration when you want to go into the play how city is going uh, to deal uh, with the new challenges. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. It's, it's positing a, a change in the role, perhaps, of the local authority, the local representatives. Instead of being leaders of opinion, they're actually moderators of opinion. And it was fascinating you were talking about the use of technology there, Zoom, but other forms of social media can play a part. In it. And tell me, I just, you, you're very much concentrating on the technology aspect of, of city life. I mean, do, you, do you see that technology also playing a part in, um, if I pick up Ivy's phrase, democratizing so decision making to, 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 to bring it to that local level and have some kind of authority and authenticity for those, those residents in the local area? Of course. So we are facing, uh, it's not only about technology, it's about we're facing a mathematization of, of society. So that's, that's why I think probably many laws, uh, we'll see that many laws are, are, are lost, but the new ones are, are going to be here. But people should be trained to really be able to participate So uh, with this prevalence of the mathematization. So, uh, um, but, but for sure, uh, we assume that two-thirds of, of uh, all jobs in, uh, in developing nations may disappear due to to this automation, robotics, machine learning, deep learning, computer vision, big data, uh, financial inclusion. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, an integral part of social stability uh, in, in, uh, around the world. So that's why I really believe in, in uh, it's part of the solution, in, in, my, in my opinion, uh, fractional ownership. So um, in the future, it's likely that, that uh, many people may not be able to rely on a steady and, and, and recurrent streams of income from, uh, from uh, classic work and, and pension when, when retired. So, so the most ideal outcome may be, uh, in my opinion, uh, the centralized technological systems such as uh, blockchain and all the, all the ecosystem allows for cost-effective uh, fractional asset ownership. By fractional ownership, it means that everyone is a fractional owner of every subsistence level of, uh, of, of service and essential product she or he might use. So, so the current design and state of blockchain and tokenization already enables anyone to hold fractional decentralized and liquid assets that, that are digital and, and uh, digital usable. Um, decentralized and fractional access is properly organized um, uh, could increase economic inclusion. That's my, my obsession and, and social yeah. stability. So the transparency of, of DLT may also uh, add to, uh, to willingness to fund socially impactful projects from the, from the population and philanthropy. So in, 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 in terms of mobility, I also envision the potential of, of, uh, for, for tourist people to share in the ownership of individual or, or or, or groups of vehicles, taxis, and then share in the revenues generated uh, from peer-to-peer uh, -peer car sharing networks, or even autonomous taxis or vehicles in the in the future. So this is this by itself 
could serve as a form of passive retirement income for for this um, um, you know uh, old old population. So I really believe uh, the, 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 the we have uh, we have the opportunity for these 21st century cities uh, and the potential to transform our lives, support more inclusive, safe, and resilient cities. And, and we can also foster open innovation, uh, but only if the digital transformation is open and decentralized. And I think yeah. this is this this innovation allows for user and, and, and citizen participation and increases the, the welfare and community experience. I think that's a fascinating number of points there. That's very consistent with what we've been picking up. I just wondered, I'm conscious it's now 13.41, we're running towards the end of our time, but Maxim, I wondered, picking up, you, you, you posed the problem there of an aging population, the change in pensions, etc. Antonio has identified quite a radical change in conceptualization of wealth, of income, of... Uh, of economic engagement. Do you see in that some potential solutions to the work that you're, or the, the issues you're facing in the work that you do? Well, I certainly see that. And, and uh, well, I, I, I totally agree with, with uh, uh, Antonio and Tony that, that that will be the future. Well, this, and this future is almost here with us today. And, you know, until this latest tragic events that we had um, very recently with the uh, Russian war uh, in the Ukraine. Well, we were planning and going this direction. I don't know whether it would change dramatically now, but we're going to this decentralization of decision-making processes to attracting the people into decision-making at the level of the huge city. Well, in Moscow, if you know, well, for a long time, there is a plot platform working, which is called Active Citizen. And uh, the, the principal decisions about, you know, the future developments, they're being made with the support of the public. And certainly we were hoping that these, these powers will be more and more and more decentralized, despite the whole construction of the Russian power, which will only become, I believe, more totalitarian now than ever before. In any case, uh, and I agree, another point that I should make, I agree in education because for me, education at all levels, uh, I mean, and for all ages, like this lifelong education is the key to many of the issues when people can acquire the new competences that they need for living and they can find themselves in the new, so to say, like, uh, activities and jobs that will be associated both with sufficient income as well with happiness. With, uh, after all, we all live for that. So mm -hmm. I, I, I only support what was said, and I hope that even in Moscow we will continue stepping this way. Thank you very much. I, ju I just wonder, I'm conscious we have very little time left, but are there any um, further comments anyone would like to make? in the context of the debate we've had, or any additional points anyone would like to make? I think it, what I find fascinating is those themes that are coming out about decentralization. I suppose my question is to what extent for those involved in political life, do you get a recognition amongst the politicians you're dealing with that this change is necessary? Well, <clears throat> I'll just leave you with a quote from Buckminster Fuller. Uh, he always said, you know, you can't fight the existing system. You have to create a new system that will make the old system obsolete. So it doesn't matter what the current powers, current leaders, current dictators think. It's going to the new the new reality and, and the, the new system that is being created in front of us is going to make the old system obsolete. It's better, it's more efficient, and and it'll just happen. Like uh Blockbuster video went away when Netflix was created. It's that simple. You can't fight it. It's just going to change. I think that's a very positive way to um, turn the debate. We're at 13.44. Could I thank you very much? I think we have to run to 13.45. So thank you very much for the contribution. It's, um, we've now lapsed the original session. Um, but I found that a very fascinating debate. Thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm conscious we have another plenary to come up um, in 10 minutes' time. But could I thank you for your contributions? It's... Um, it's been a real pleasure meeting you. Likewise, thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. You thank too. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.